Now that brings me to tonight's lecture, which is always a very difficult one to give because people have forgotten and people are very sensitive. And I was very sensitive because I was also on one side of this fence. And the question is, is this being judgmental? Is it being hateful if we speak about these things? Does it concern people or does it concern systems? And I want to make it quite clear from the beginning that what we're going to talk about tonight has nothing to do with people, has nothing to do with individuals, has nothing to do with knowing and not knowing, because the Bible says the time of ignorance God winks at. It's a beautiful verse in the Bible. The time of ignorance God winks at. He overlooks it. He's not going to judge you by what you did not know. So God is a God of fairness and kindness. But a system, a system that takes the emphasis away from God and places it in another area is a system that works contrary to the plan of salvation. And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about the twin pillars of the Reformation. What made the Reformation what it is? And why is there no more Reformation? You know, they called themselves Protestants. And I often ask the question, in today's society, particularly in South Africa, most people would still consider themselves part of the Protestant world. Am I right? So if you ask them, what are you protesting against? They look at you as though you've just fallen off a bus. What do you mean? You see, the word Protestant has a positive meaning and it has a negative meaning. The word pro, testari, means to be in favor of the witness. So that's a positive aspect. You want to be pro testari. But it also has a negative connotation, which means to protest against something. <coughs> and Jesus said, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, in the process of saving the world, did Jesus expose false rituals and teachings amongst the Pharisees, yes or no? Constantly. They loved him for it, right? No, they hated him for it. So he also was protestari, because he was for the word of God, but he was also protestant. He protested against the twisting and the falsifications of truth. So that's what it means to be a Protestant. Now, why did people start to protest in the first place? Well, it has a long history. One of the church fathers was a name, man by the name of Augustine. And Augustine wrote a book called The City of God. And in this book, Augustine places the emphasis on the church as the kingdom of God. Augustine said, God reigns within the church, and therefore the church is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God must of necessity take over the world, so the world must become subject to the church. That was his philosophy. And so, the church was encouraged to assume the rulership of the nation. And so the church people were in the king's courts. And if you go to ancient history, and you look at France, for example, and you look at things like the three musketeers, there was always this conflict between the men in red and the men in blue. Isn't that correct? 
And uh, the one represented churchcraft and the other one represented statecraft. And so instead of carrying the gospel of salvation to the world, church leaders began to seek prestige, power, and they did it often by political intrigue. And the result was the lights went out. And it's called the Dark Ages. That's what it's called. And then people started protesting and saying, excuse me, our emphasis is wrong. Our emphasis is entirely wrong. The gospel is about a person. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. The gospel is about salvation in Christ. And so the first ones to start protesting were the Valdenses. And the Valdenses were a group of people that lived, in fact, scattered throughout Europe, particularly later on in the Alps. They were, in France, they were called the Albigenses. And the Albigenses had the Bible as their only standard, and they were systematically slaughtered. The Valdenses also were systematically slaughtered and hid in dens and in caves and things like that. Then Joachim, he started talking about these issues. And eventually, Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, became very, very vocal. Now you must understand, Vic Wycliffe was a Roman Catholic priest. And he attacked the excesses that were occurring in the church and the doctrines that had taken away the emphasis from Christ. Now, Wycliffe didn't die a martyr's death, but he passed on his information to Huss and Jerome. And these people started running with this message, and eventually it spread to such an extent that the church became alarmed, and they arrested Johann Huss and Jerome and sentenced them to death, even though the king had promised free passage. And uh, at Constance, they burnt Johannes at the stake. And then they remembered that he had received his information from Wycliffe, who had been dead for 42 years already. And so in retrospect, they went and dug up Wycliffe and burnt his bones. And then they took the ashes and they threw them in the river Swift. And uh, the, the theology behind that is quite interesting, you see. They, they figured that if you are burnt, then you won't be part of the resurrection. So there's quite a debate about that. Is it, is it okay to be cremated or is it not okay to be cremated? Even today, people worry about these things. Well, I'll tell you my personal opinion. Dust you are and... Dust you will be. You will return back to dust. So if you are cremated, then all that basically happens, you go to dust quickly. So the only difference between cremation and non-cremation is that the worms are deprived of a meal <laughs> because of the speed of the issue. But anyways, that's what happened. But instead of stopping what they thought was going to be the case, this, this protest, it actually fueled the protest. And then in the 16th century, men like Luther and Knox and Calvin and Baxter and Cranmer and Ridley and Latimer and Rogers and all of these people started preaching this message, some of them dying at the stake, and it just took off like wildfire. And the message was really quite astounding. The Reformation rested on two discoveries. The first one was the rediscovery of Christ and salvation in him. Martin Luther, as he crept up those stairs, the La Santa Scala. Do you know about the La Santa Scala in Rome? It's got such a fascinating history. They're the La Santa Scala. Those are the stairs where Jesus apparently was on when he was uh, in, the, in the trial before Pilate. 
and where the blood dripped down from his crown of thorns, and it dripped onto these stairs. Now, these stairs are in Rome, but this took place where? In Jerusalem. So, excuse me, how did the stairs get to Rome? Well, the story goes that one morning they all woke up and miraculously angels had transported the stairs from Jerusalem to Rome and they were so excited they built a cathedral around it and there they are to this day including the blood where they put the glass little plaques on it and then as you crawl up you find remission from purgatory by crawling up these stairs and Martin Luther was in the process of climbing up these stairs on his knees when a memory verse flashed through his mind which said, the just shall live by faith. And he got up halfway up the stairs and didn't complete the process. And that's where the Reformation started. So they rediscovered the centrality of Christ and that works wasn't the way to save yourself, but you were saved through faith in the completed works of Jesus Christ. So that, that was central. And then the second point, which fused them into a unit, was the discovery and the identity of the Antichrist as they perceived him. Those are the issues of the Reformation. And the discovery of the all-sufficiency of Christ rested on the Word of God, so the Word of God was put back into the middle of the debate, the Bible and the Bible alone, so the watchwords of the Reformation were sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola Christos. You're saved by grace and grace alone. There's no salvation outside of Christ, and in his Word you will find everything that you need for salvation. And then, of course, the identity of the Antichrist as the opposition to this message. Now, I'm going to talk quite a bit about this man. His name is Gratan Guinness. Now, Gratan Guinness was a Church of England theologian. And he lived, as you see, he wrote this book in 1887. How long ago is that? That's almost 130 years ago, right? So, fascinating. So, what did they believe just over 100 years ago in Protestantism? And this is what he writes. He says, The Reformation of the 16th century, which gave birth to Protestantism, was based on Scripture. It gave back to the world the Bible. It taught the scriptures. It exposed the errors and corruptions of Rome by the use of the word sword of the spirit. It applied the prophecies and accepted their practical guidance. Such reformation work requires to be done afresh. We have suffered prophetic anti-papal truth to be too much forgotten. This generation is dangerously latitudinarian. I like these words. Indifferent to truth and error on points on which scripture is tremendously decided and absolutely clear. So he had no doubt as to his theology. And he talks about the prophecies and he talks about anti-papal sentiment. Now Maxwell is another Protestant who wrote, the man who thinks he can be a Protestant and yet reject the Bible or some portion of it is making a profound mistake. True Protestantism cannot only be anti-Catholic. Now, let me put this into perspective. I myself was an atheist, but I was also a Catholic. Once a Catholic, always a Catholic, so they say. <laughs> and uh, when, when atheism came into conflict, then Catholicism comes back up into you. And it's only scripture that gives you the distinction between the two. Now, my father was Catholic, my mother was Lutheran. So I had both of these in my home, in my upbringing. 
Now, why was Catholicism contrary to the Bible? Because Catholicism teaches that salvation is achieved through the system. You achieve salvation by passing through the various rituals of the church. So they talk about the sacramental system and there is salvation in the sacramental system. So when you are baptized as an infant, that means you're already under that grace and you are saved. And then all the other sacraments come. If you take part in Holy Communion, that has sacrificial value. Then if you confess your sins to a priest, then that has sacramental value. So salvation goes through the system and the priesthood becomes a mediator between man and God. Now there's a problem there because the Bible says there's only one mediator between man and God and that is the man Christ Jesus. So Christ is not negated and taken right out of the system but he's placed in a position where the Bible does not place him. That's the problem with Catholicism. So let's get it quite clear that if Christ said there's no other way whereby you can be saved except through Christ Jesus, can a system now say you can be saved by any means as long as you acknowledge the church? Help me with that? All right, but this is, this is the case. So in that sense, it is against the precepts of the gospel. So if you want to be a Protestant, you can't only be anti this system, but you also have to be anti-evolutionist and you have to be anti all the isms. Because whatever is contrary to the Bible, a Protestant must reject. Because if he wants to believe in sola scriptura, well, then he must be a Protestant in every single way. Now this is Martin Luther writing. This is Martin Luther's Schrift, Schriften, his writings. And he says about the book of Daniel, Therefore we bid that all earnest Christians read the book of Daniel, to whom it will be a consolation and a great profit in these last miserable times. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is at hand. For the same reason we find in Daniel that all the dreams and visions, however fearful they might be, end always in joy and gladness with the coming of Christ and his kingdom. Now remember that Catholicism taught that the kingdom was already here and that it was ruling within the church. Yea, for that chief article of faith, the coming of Christ, these visions were given, explained and recorded. So Martin Luther was an avid Daniel fan. In fact, he was so excited about the book Daniel that when he started translating the Old Testament after finishing the New Testament, he didn't start with the book of Genesis, which is the logical place. He started with the book of Daniel because he felt everybody should have the book of Daniel in the vulgar tongue so that they could read it and understand it. Now, why were they so excited about the book Daniel? Martin Luther writing about the second coming, and he wrote this in 1538. In commenting on, commenting on the prevalent godlessness, Luther said, I hope that day is not far off and we shall still see it. I've got news for him. That was 500 years ago. I hope the last day will not tarry over 100 years because God's word will be taken away again and great darkness will come for scarcity of ministers of the word. Now, the irony of the matter is that there are more Bibles in circulation today than at any other time in history. But sadly, I would like to suggest that there's more darkness concerning the Word of God than in any other time in history. Martin Luther. This is now, again, taken from Dabinier's History of the Reformation. These are the classic history books on the Reformation. And he say, says, Luther proved. What did he do? He proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John, 
by the epistles of Paul, Peter, and Jude that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy. This is history. I'm quoting history. I'm not saying this. And all the people did say, Amen. A holy terror seized their souls. It was Antichrist whom they beheld seated on the pontifical throne. This new idea, which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther into the midst of his contemporaries, inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. So here was the Reformation, and it was pointing the finger at Rome. Wycliffe had started it. Hus had picked up on this. And finally, Luther and them started using Scripture to prove it. And this is fascinating. Now, here's another interesting story. The book of Revelation in the New Testament. Martin Luther first translated the New Testament. And when he came to the book of Revelation, he looked at all of these beasts and horns and stuff and dragons and stuff, and he said, this guy was drunk. What is this stuff here? He couldn't make any sense out of the book of Revelation. And so initially, he thought, this book shouldn't be in the Bible. But because it was there, he translated it. But he had no knowledge as to what it meant. And then they started the prophetic study of the Old Testament, and the book of Daniel grabbed him and fascinated him. And his friends, Melanchthon and all of these people, they concentrated on the prophecies of the book of Daniel, and it's as if a light went on. And all of a sudden, Daniel became the key that unlocked Revelation. And then when he brought out his big Bible, the complete Bible, there were all the illustrations and most of them came from the book of Revelation. Like this one, for example. This one came out of Martin Luther's first big Bible. And it has the dragon spewing water out against this woman standing on the moon with the 12 stars around her head. Anybody know from which book in Revelation that comes? Which chapter? Chapter 12. Okay, and this one, it's also out of Martin Luther's first Bible. Here you have the kings of the world bowing down to the terrible seven-headed beast, and there's a woman riding the beast. What chapter is that? 17. That's chapter 17. But now, they're actually going a step further. They're putting their theology into the picture. Because the woman that in the Bible is addressed as Babylon, the prostitute, is here depicted with the triple crown on her head. Now who wore the tiara or the triple crown? The Pope wore it. So this is an identifying picture where it says that the kings of the world are paying homage to the political structure which is under the control being ridden and steered by the woman of Revelation who is the papacy. Because in the Bible, a woman is a church. That's why Christ is coming to fetch his bride. And you have a woman in white, a virgin, which is the true church, and you have the harlot on the other side, which is the one that is propagating falsehood. And here are some other illustrations you'll find in Martin Luther's Bible. He also taught by contrast, as did Hus, for example. Here you have Jesus chasing the moneylenders out of the temple. And by contrast, here he has the money exchangers and the money coming into the temple, and the one presiding is the representative of Christ. And he has the triple crown on his head. And then, fascinating, so it's the antithesis of what happened there. And then, fascinatingly, they put the little dog in the corner there. They're so cute, these reformers. Now, why would they put a little dog there? What's a the little dog got to do with it? 
The Bible teaches outside of the dogs. And dogs in the Bible represent paganism. So what they are saying theologically is that what the papacy was doing was the antithesis of what Christ was doing. Christ was saying the kingdom of God has to do with spiritual things. Render unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar, but render unto God what is due unto God. Whereas here, the finances were intermingled with their theology. So it was a syncretism. And paganism had walked right into the church and was sitting there quite comfortably. And then, all roads read to Rome, reads Wycliffe, Tyndall, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer, Bunyan, King James Bible translators, the Baptist Confession, Sir Isaac Newton, and then all these great men like Spurgeon, etc. They all accepted this theology based on prophecy. Now, nobody believes that today anymore. The churches teach one of two theologies, preterism or futurism. Preterism puts everything pertaining to the scriptures in the past, including the Antichrist. So it's a past event. Futurism throws everything into the future and it only deals with the Jews after the rapture of the Christian church. So the Christian church is not involved in any of it. Those are two diametrically opposed theologies. And both of them come from Roman Catholicism. They're both Jesuit doctrines. Now the one says, preterism, the Antichrist was in the past, and they they give him a name and they say it was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he was a Greek king that for a while defiled the temple, the literal temple in Jerusalem. The other says, no, the Antichrist is someone who will come out of the east, probably the tribe of Dan, and he will have only dealings with the Jews. And he will sit in a literal temple, which then must, of course, be rebuilt, because it doesn't exist today. So those are the two theologies, but that's not Reformed theology. Let's have a look at Reformed theology and what they believed, and then we can see whether they were off the wall or whether current thinking is contradicting the Bible. Well, the two prophecies that they use mostly is of course the prophecy of Daniel 2, which is the ABC of prophecy, where Daniel runs through the kingdoms of the world, and you cannot go wrong, because Daniel explains himself. And there there is a statue with a head of gold, and it is interpreted as Babylon representing the head of gold. And after Babylon there would be a kingdom inferior, to Babylon, Medo-Persians, the, the silver. Then there would be hips of bronze, another kingdom. And then legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. So that would be the progression of kingdoms upon this earth. Then in Daniel 7 you have a repetition. And the head of gold is equated with the lion with eagle wings, which is Babylon. By the way, that was the symbol of Babylon. If you go to the restoration of the Istar Gate, there you'll find these symbols. And then you have the bear raised up on one of its sides, the Medo-Persian Empire. And the Medes and the Persians weren't equally strong. There were three ribs in his mouth. And those were the three great wars whereby the Medo-Persians overcame Babylon. And then the next kingdom was this leopard beast which represents the brass and it had four heads and that's quite interesting because when Alexander's kingdom was divided it was split into four. Now, you know, the Bible is so wonderful. If you go to Daniel chapter 8 they will actually tell you in another, in another vision using different animals covering the same ground that it represents Greece 
and the four are four kingdoms that will arise out of it. The generals of Alexander divided the kingdom largely into four. And then would come a terrible beast, which is the equivalent of Rome. And it had ten horns, and the statue had how many toes? Ten. And then there is a description of a little horn that arises amongst the ten, and that is a description of Antichrist. So the reformers interpreted it. So let's have a look at how they actually interpret it. Now this little horn in Daniel chapter 7, it says in verse 24, he shall be diverse from the first. He shall be different. Now first we must understand what a horn is. The Bible has to explain itself. It says these beasts are four kingdoms that will arise out of the earth. And the horns are kings or kingdoms that will arise out of these kingdoms. So a horn is basically also a kingdom, normally from a subdivision. So this horn that came up amongst them was different from the others. It was different. The others were, by definition, political entities, kingdoms. So if we look at the attributes as given in Daniel chapter 7, it arises out of the fourth beast. So what is it? If the first one's Babylon, the second one is Medo-Persia, the next one is Greece, the fourth one is Rome. Now if we go to preterism, which is preached today in some areas, then they say it is a Greek king. Then out of which one would he, should he have arisen? The third one, because that was Greece, but it comes out of the fourth one. So Antiochus is in trouble. As, as the little horn power, because he was Greek. And this one arises out of the fourth beast, so it's Roman. The second attribute was, it arises among the ten horns, which gives you an historic point of vantage. Because if it arises out of the ten, then the ten must already be there, which means Rome must already have been subdivided into its various territories which became the Germanic kingdoms. So it arises out of Europe. Among the ten horns, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them. So right there where Rome is divided into ten, there he makes his appearance. Now we have a problem with futurism. Futurism gets its antichrist in the future, but this one comes at the time when Rome is divided. So here you have a historic time, whereas futurism throws that time into the future and then has another problem. It takes him out of the Middle East, which has nothing to do with these ten horns. And takes him not out of a Roman system, but out of Dan, which is a Jewish system. So there you have two problems, with the preterist view and the futurist view. Number three, he arises after the ten horns. So the ten horns must already be established, and they must be there, then he arises. He'll arise after them, verse 24. And then, this is the one that is different. He's different from the other ones. He shall be diverse from the first. Now all the others are political kingdoms. But this one is a horn, so he's a political entity. It's a kingdom, but he's different. Now what makes him different? He's not just political, he's also ecclesiastical. What other attributes does the Bible give? It says, well, he's more stout. He's tough. He's prescriptive. Does it apply? Was Rome prescriptive to the other kingdoms? Yes or no? Absolutely. If a king didn't draw the line, pull the line or whatever... He was sawn off and he had to go barefoot to Rome and beg for his crown. And this was the power that decided who gets what and what belongs to whom. So when new territories were discovered, like the Americas, it was Rome that decided, you, my friend Portugal, you get that territory. You, my faithful servant, 
Spain, you get that territory. So where does Argentine and Brazil and all of these countries, where do they come from? Peru and who drew the lines and who drew the maps? They were not drawn in South America. They were drawn in Rome. This was a prescriptive power. And it was so powerful that if a king was excommunicated, the entire nation went into collapse. So yes, he was more stout. And then he uprooted three kingdoms. Now if you look at the history of the Roman papacy, you have the great Arian crisis where Catholicism and Arianism came into opposition with one another and there were three kingdoms that stood against Rome and they were destroyed, obliterated. It was the Vandals, the Aurelian and the Ostrogoths. Gone. They don't exist anymore. So historically, this is fascinating. And then this little verse, verse 8 and 25. In this horn were the eyes of a man and he spoke great words against the Most High. So now you know that it is an ecclesiastical power because it speaks against the Most High. And there was a big issue regarding that verse. And then it would wear out the saints. In other words, it would be a persecuting power. Was there a great persecution in Europe? Was there an inquisition that killed millions? Was there a 30-year war? Was there conflict and an armada that was sent to England to destroy it? Yes or no? Yes. So there was persecution. There was no doubt about that. And then it would change times and laws. This is interesting. Now who set the times in the first place? God set the times. And right there in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, he set the times. The first day, the second day, third day, up to the seventh day. Did he say when the day began and when it ended? Absolutely. He set the times. This power would change the times. And it would change the laws. Now if it changed God's times, then the laws referred to must refer to what? God's law. So this is a power that is against the Most High, he speaks against the Most High, he changes God's times, and he changes God's laws. That's fascinating. By the way, if you have the power to change someone's laws, then aren't you the ruler? Yes or no? When the new government came into power in South Africa, didn't they change some of the old laws? Would they have been able to do that if they didn't rule? Of course not. And then there would be a specific time that he would rule as a little horn power. Time, times, and half a time. They shall be given into his hand until a time, time, and the dividing of time. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail just now. Fascinating verse. The fourth beast, which shall be different, shall devour the whole earth and shall trample it and crush it. How much of the earth? All right. Can Rome rule the entire world? Does it, would that include China? Wouldn't it include Japan? And all of these other nations? Well, let's put it on the back burner and leave it there. And we'll look at it in a little bit more detail later. And then it would exist until the end of time. And then dominion will be taken away and it will be destroyed. So from when to when will this power exist? According to the book of Daniel. From the division of the Roman Empire into ten until when? Until the end of time. Now take futurism. The Antichrist was Antiochus Epiphanes IV and he lived as a Greek king and he's dead and he's gone. Is time still continuing? Aren't we still here? So he can't be the Antichrist. What about the future one? Doesn't arise at the right time? It's got nothing to do with the church. 
and he comes sometime in the future. They can't qualify. This power, if it arose at the fall of Rome and the division of Rome, and it lives until the end of time, must it be here now, yes or no? Okay. You know that, of course, every time you say yes, you're in big trouble. <laughs> now, how certain were the reformers that they had this message right? They were so certain they put it in stone so that no one should forget. This is the Rathaus in Germany, and here on the portals they have a depiction in Gothic style of what happened there. Now this is Headlam's opposite. It says here the Rathaus with three magnificent Doric portals over which the prophetic beasts of Daniel 7 are carved. These impressive figures authorized by the city council were sculptured by the well-known artist Leonard Kern in 1617. Excuse me. That's just about 400 years ago, isn't that so? So for 400 years, they've been up against the wall there. Under the buildings are the vaulted dungeons and chambers of torture, early implied by the Holy Office of the Inquisition, for the persecution of dissenters and confessors of the Reformed faith. Because, of course, the whole of Europe was Catholic, but eventually Nuremberg became a Protestant city. And this is when they put these pictures or these sculptures of Daniel 7 against the wall. Now here's the one portal and uh, there you find two beasts and you find two kings. And if you go to the other portal you'll find two beasts and two kings. Now let's go a little bit closer to them. There you have the lion with eagle wings. That's the first beast in Daniel chapter 7. And next to it they have a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. So who did they say it was? Babylon, because he was the king of Babylon. <coughs> All right, so reformers put it in stone that they believe that this lion represents Babylon. That's what the reformers believe. There's the bear with the three little ribs in his mouth. Next to it they put Cyrus the Great. So who did they say it was? Medo-Persians. And there you have the four-headed, leopard-like beast. And next to it, Alexander the Great. So who did they say it was? They said it was Greece. There's no doubt about it. We cannot argue with them. And then you have the terrible beast with the ten horns and that funny little horn in the middle. And next to it, they put Julius Caesar. So the reformers want you to know that they believe that this was Rome. And then they give a complete description of this little horn of Daniel 7, 8. I considered the horns and behold there came up amongst them another little horn before whom were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man. So they put little eyes in him, you see. And a mouth speaking great things. They gave him a little mouth. They even gave him a nose. They put it on there. And then they said, we believe that that's the papacy. So, 400 years later, yours truly went there, and uh, we <coughs> asked the young people, and we asked the educated people, and we asked the old people, excuse me, what do these things mean up here? And it was fascinating what we heard. What does this mean? What is this beast up there? Can you explain it to us? Now, here's a little video we took, and uh, it's the interview with all of these people. Some of them are young, some of them are teachers. Now, a lot of it is in German, one of them is in English, but there's a subtitle, so you can read it. Just listen to a little bit of that interview. Do you know, do you have an idea what does it mean, It's two sculptures? 
I don't know what it means. I, really I don't, don't know, know what it means. Darf? Ne? Markus Lukas, Johannes Matthäus. Ja, ja das Ich habe die Bibel nie gelesen, ich bin Protestant. Ja, das sind die vier. Sie sind Protestant ja, und ja. haben die Bibel nicht gelesen? Nein, ich... Ach ja, du? Ich bin Protestant. Ja. Ja. Hast du gelesen, wie liest man nicht? Wie kennt man? Ich habe die Bibel gesehen. Die Bibel liest man nicht, die Bibel kennt man. Das ist Bibel ja kein Buch, was man liest und am Ende weiß man, wie es ausgeht. Ja? <lacht> ah ja. Mhm. Wissen Sie vielleicht die Bedeutung dieser Skulpturen, wenn Sie sich das anschauen? Oh, nein. Haben Sie also eine Idee? Schon, ja. Haben Sie eine Idee? Wissen Sie nicht, was das sein könnte, ja. was das darstellt? Nein, könnte man ja. gar nicht vorstellen. Ja. Was könnte denn das bedeuten? Die Kinder dürfen auch was sagen. Diese Figuren da oben und die Tiere im Hintergrund. Was könnte das für eine Bedeutung haben? Habt ihr in der Schule da schon mal was drüber gehört? Eigentlich nicht da. Doch gar nichts Eigentlich drüber gehört? Nee. Im Geschichtsunterricht, im Religionsunterricht, gar nichts gehört? Eigentlich nicht. Nichts gehört? Mhm. Weißt du es, Papa? Ich weiß es grundsätzlich auch nicht. Sind Sie denn Nürnberger? Oder aus äh, ich bin eigentlich, äh, ja, ich bin eigentlich Nürnberger. Wohne zwar mittlerweile in Fürth, aber ja, ich bin, ja. bin schon immer. Ja. Ich bin seit 1949 in Nürnberg. in Nürnberg. Was könnten denn die Skulpturen, die Figuren bedeuten, hier am Rathaus von Nürnberg? Da muss ich Ihnen ganz ehrlich sagen, habe ich mir so äh, das, äh, noch keine Gedanken darüber gemacht. Ich muss sagen, ich habe eigentlich noch nie hingeguckt. Ja. Aber irgendwie macht es mir den Eindruck, als ob das irgendwas Maritimes äh, Maritim? Alles ja. Neptun. Neptun? Neptun. Also ich ja. bin jetzt wirklich überfragt. Ja. Das muss ja. ich ganz ehrlich sagen. Ja. Ja. Es gab nie eine Aufklärung in der Volkshochschule zu Nürnberg oder nee, in den Schulen Schule über das Rathaus wurde und seine, nee, ja, nee, wurde nicht sagen, gesprochen. Über, überhaupt ja. nicht. Also Hat man nicht mit. Das, ist, das ist ein Lehrer aus Nürnberg. Das ist, Nürnberg. Das ist, Nürnberg. Das ist ein Lehrer, Sie sind Lehrer aus Lehrer. Nürnberg. Ein Lehrer. <lacht> also Sie haben keine Idee, meine Herren? In der Schule was darüber gehört, Wolfscher bei der Stadtführung. Wolfscher Bau, jawohl, ja, ich erbaut. Ich habe bestimmt mal was darüber gehört. Eine Idee? Also eine Idee, wenn es ein gutes ja, Ding ist, ja, müsste ja, doch ja, dort ja, stehen ja, irgendwo. Ja. 1600 selbiges Mal? Im 16. Jahrhundert, sagen wir mal so. Oh, dann ist ja. es falsch. Ja. Dann ist es ja. 1600 selbiges ja. Mal. Und was das können wir die Figuren? Verbindung mit Venedig zu tun? Machen Sie mal weiter. Also, zwei Figuren, Wegen zwei Tiere im Hintergrund. Ist es der venezianische Löwe irgendwo dabei? Wenn können, Sie sind Lehrer. Welches Fach belegen Sie denn? Ich bin Hauptschullehrer. Hauptschullehrer? Ja. Dann wird es in der Stadtführung in Exkursionen hier aufgeklärt, was diese Bedeutungen sind? Am, am Wolfsonathaus wird das gemacht? Also ich habe es in der Uni damals gemacht, das ist schon ja. über 20 Jahre ja. her. Ne? Ja. Also von daher ja. weiß ich jetzt nicht so genau, ob das, ob das vorgekommen ja. ist. Ja. Ja, da fragen Sie mich natürlich jetzt, was. <lacht> ja. Da muss ich leider passen. Ja. Noch nie was drüber gehört nee. in den Exkursionen? Nee, mit, mit Sicherheit mal. Ja. Allerdings ja. geht es natürlich dann auch immer schnell wieder verloren. Ja, verstehe. Ne? Aber so in den Stadtführungen zu Nürnberg wird es nicht erwähnt, was die Bedeutung dieser Figuren am Rathaus ist. Zumindest jetzt nicht bei denen, ja. äh, die mir im Gedächtnis geblieben sind. Ja, ja. Und Sie sind konkret für die Lochgefängnisse Richtig. zuständig? Allerdings ja. nur als Absicht. Ja, Absicht. Ja, ja, ja. Schauen Sie mal, sind Sie aus Nürnberg? Ja. Schauen Sie mal hier auf unser Rathaus. Diese Figuren, welche Bedeutung haben diese Figuren? Ja, das kann ich nicht alle sagen. Das ist zum Teil der Reichsadler. Der Reichsadler? Das äh, ist äh, das andere Wappen, aber nicht das Wappen der Stadt Nürnberg. Ja, ist nicht das ja. Wappen der Stadt Nürnberg? Aha. Ja. Und die Tiere und die Menschen, also diese Figuren oben, welche nicht, Bedeutung? Ich nicht so wissen Sie nicht, wissen Sie nicht. Ich danke Ihnen sehr herzlich. You know what's interesting? This last guy. He's the trained guide to the Ratshaus, who's supposed to tell everybody what everything means. And he's the one who takes you through the, the dungeons in the bottom. So he's a trained guide, and we asked him, what does this mean? He hasn't got the foggiest idea. In fact, nobody had any idea. Do you think somebody wants them to forget? Is it possible? This is Romanism and the Reformation. This is Church of England, 120 years ago. There are three distinct sets of prophecies of the rise, character, deeds, and doom of Romanism. The first is found in the book of Daniel. The second in the epistles of Paul. 
and the third in the letters of the Apocalypse of John. And no one of these three is complete in itself. It is only by combining their separate features that we obtain a perfect portrait. Daniel gives the political character. Paul gives the ecclesiastical character. And John in the Revelation gives the combination of both. This is Reformed theology 120 years ago. Nobody believes this today. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, I'm letting the Reformer speak. The power symbolized by the proud, intelligent, blasphemous, head-like little horn of the Roman beast to the city votes, on the contrary, the greater part of the prophecy, and I must ask you now carefully to note the various points that prove that this horn is a marvelous prophetic symbol or hieroglyph of the Roman papacy, fitting it as one of Chubb's key fits the locks for which it is made perfectly and in every part while it refuses absolutely to adapt itself to any other. Reformed theology 120 years ago. And then he unpacks it. This is all a quote from this reformer, this reformed theology. Church of England, its place within the body of the Fourth Empire, period of its origin, soon after the division of the Roman territory into ten horns, ten kingdoms. Would you agree with it so far? Its nature, different from the other kingdoms, though in some respects like them, it was a horn, but with eyes and a mouth. It would be a kingdom, like the rest, because that's what Daniel said, a horn is a kingdom. A monarchy, but its kings would be overseers or bishops. Moral character, boastful, blasphemous, great words spoken against the Most High. Lawlessness, it would claim authority over times and laws. Its opposition to the saints, it would be a persecuting power, and that for so long a period that it would wear out the saints of the Most High who would be given into his hands for a time. Its duration, time, times and a half, or 1,260 years. Excuse me, who's writing this? This is Grattan Guinness, the theologian of the Church of England, summarizing their position on the papacy. Now, modern theology... Futurism puts the Antichrist in the future, remember, when he will come and defile the literal temple, which is not there, which still has to be rebuilt, and he will do it for a literal three and a half years. Because the Bible says he rules for time, times, and half a time. Now, what did the Reformers do with that? Did they take them as literal years, or did they take them as day years? Well, they took them as day years because he says time, times and a half or 1,260 years. Now, let me explain that to you. In the Jewish calendar, the year had 360 days. So three and a half years would be how many days? 1,260. And then the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel and in other places, says you must take a day for a year. That would make it 1,260 years. Now, the English have a wonderful saying which says, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Now, if you apply the prophetic symbols, let's say pertaining to Jesus, there's a magnificent prophecy in the book of Daniel, which, by the way, is forbidden by the Jewish rabbis to be read by any Jew. Because there it describes the exact time of the coming of the Messiah. Because it says, From the going forth of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, unto Messiah the Prince shall be. And then there's a time prophecy. It's part of the 70 weeks prophecy. Now the fascinating thing is, if you make it literal days, it's ludicrous, because it doesn't work out. But if you take 
the times as day years, it works out exactly because the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem went out by Artaxerxes in the year 457 BC. And if you add the prophetic time that they give, it comes to exactly to the anointing of Christ. Can you see why they don't want anyone to read it? It's a major problem. But if you don't apply the day year principle, the prophecy is gibberish. So it works. What does it work here? And the answer is yes, it does. Because the papacy has two aspects. It is a horn, but it is also a woman. A horn is the political character, and a woman is the church, is the ecclesiastical character. So as a woman, she is the church. Politically, when did she gain her political power? In order to qualify as a horn, you have to have a territory, you have to have jurisdiction over that territory. And you must have a ruler that rules in that territory, otherwise you don't qualify as a horn. When did the church receive its political power? And the answer is, when the Ostrogoths who ruled in Rome and were contrary to the church ruling, were removed. And that happened in the year 538 AD. So we have a starting date. 538 AD, the church assumed the power that used to belong to the emperor. Now let's add 1260 to 538. Then I get to the year 1798. Now, what happened in 1798? Napoleon marched into Rome, took the Pope exile, and declared the papal political system at an end. He confiscated the Vatican states. And he declared a secular state, which is Italy. So the horn power, the political power, ended smack bang on time for this prophecy. 1798, exactly 1,260 years. Is that chance? But then the Bible has something interesting to say because if you read a little bit ahead, if you sneak a preview in the book of Revelation, it says the mortal wound was healed and the whole world wondered after the beast, which is a political power. Whether it's a horn or a beast, it's the same thing. So, how did it get its political power back? Well, in 1929, Mussolini made a concordat with the Vatican and cut out a little piece of Italy and gave it to the Pope as his political territory. So, since 1929, Again, there is a resurrection of the political power. It didn't affect the woman, only the politics, because Daniel speaks about the political aspect. So smack bang, this is what the reformers believed. They believed it was years. It's doom. It would suffer the loss of dominion before it was itself destroyed. They shall take away its dominion to consume and destroy it to the end. So it will be destroyed in the end as a political entity again. And then he summarizes and says they all meet in the Roman papacy. The Latin language of the sea is the only church that has ever been named from a city. It fulfills the first condition thereof. During that time, the ten kingdoms were forming. The little horn grew up amongst the ten. The papacy developed synchronously with the Gothic kingdoms. So here is what the reformers believe. Then he says, let's have a look at Paul and see if it gels. Paul's view consists of two parts. The first gives a general view of a great apostasy, and the second, careful drawn portrait of the power in which this apostasy would be headed up. And let's see what Paul says. Then he quotes Paul, Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. So this system would arise from whom? 
from the church. Now again, futurism and preterism have a problem. Because Antiochus Epiphanes didn't come out of the church. He was a pagan. And the future one won't come out of the church either. He's a Jew. So here you have a problem. Paul says it comes out of the church. Then he'll speak perverse things. And then he gives a little details. He says they'll depart from the faith. They'll have doctrines of devils. This is all quoting Paul. They will forbid marrying. And they will command to abstain from foods, meats in the, in the old writing means foods, certain foods, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving, etc. Question, which church forbids its ecclesia to marry? Catholic Church, papacy. Which church introduced regular fast days and periods forbidding certain foods to be eaten at certain times. Rome did. That's why we still have the Feast of Lent, don't we? When you have certain fasts. And these are means to gain points. And this is contrary to the Scripture. The Scripture is not against fasting, but the Scripture is against making it a means to salvation. That's the problem. So then he, quote, he says, here we have not only a prediction that there would be an apostasy or falling away, the faith in the Christian church, but a description of its origin. It would be satanic, its doctrines would be doctrines of demons. It was to assume authority, lay down laws, prohibitions, prominent amongst these, the prohibition of marriage, etc. It would forbid certain foods, substitution of an external right religiousness, and self-imposed sacrifice for true holiness of heart. So here's a counterfeit religion that's developing. This is how the reformers saw these prophecies. And then he says, quoting Paul, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their consciences seared as with a hot iron, this feature of false profession reappears in the corresponding prophecy in 2 Timothy concerning the last days in which the abettors and adherents of apostasy are described as men having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So he says these men, would they not be open opponents of godliness, but on the contrary, would be great professors of godliness. So they look good, they do many good deeds, they speak many wonderful words, but the system is actually contrary to the gospel of salvation in Christ. Because it replaces the mediator Christ with another mediator, or a mediatrix, Mary, for example. You can use the saints as mediators. Did the modern pope, the present one, just canonize people as saints, yes or no? Well, then you can seek their intercession, according to Roman Catholic theology. But the Bible says there is one intercessor between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Isn't this contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Did the modern Pope issue an indulgence, yes or no? Yes, Pope Francis issued the greatest indulgence in history. Anyone who follows him on Twitter gets an indulgence. Now, I always say, if, he's the, if he is the Pope for the poor, then why do only those who can afford a cell phone and a contract get an indulgence? What about those who can't? I would say everybody who can't follow me on Twitter can get an indulgence. <laughs> no duration at all is mentioned, but two limits. Paul says, already, the apostasy was developing, and then he said he would be destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming. So there are two points, from the time of Rome to the end of time. Same time period as Daniel. And then he sits in the temple of God. The face of the man of sin is the face of a false apostle, the dark face of a Judas, written upon the wall of the temple, son of perdition. The man of sin is a Judas, a secret enemy, while a sinning friend, a familiar friend, yet a fatal foe, betrays with a kiss and a hell, Master. You know, this word, son of perdition, is used only twice in the Bible, once for Judas 
and once for the man of sin. And sin is the transgression of the law. Now what if someone changes God's law? Isn't that a transgression? Observe the place occupied by the man of sin, the temple or house of God. This is not and cannot be any Jewish temple. That's pretty adamant. This is Church of England theology 120 years ago. Cannot be a Jewish temple. What does futurism teach? It's a Jewish temple that will be rebuilt. And that's the entire Christian world today except for a few groups here and there. This is, this is amazing. They used to say, no, why not? And then they give their reason. Paul, who uses this expression in his prophetic portrait of Romanism, employs it both in Corinthians and Ephesians, with reference to the Christian church. In the second epistle to Corinthians, writing to the Gentile Christians, he says, you are the temple of the living God. In Ephesians, he calls the church a holy temple, a habitation of God through the Spirit. And you can take this metaphor even further than they took it. Peter speaks about living stones being built into a spiritual temple, which is the church. And the Bible speaks about you being the temple of God in which Christ wants to reside. So we've moved from the physical to a spiritual temple, scripturally. And they say, therefore, it cannot be a physical temple in which he sits. So this Antichrist sits in the church. And he is a professor of Jesus Christ while he actually denies the very tenets that make Christ the Savior of the world. So to Paul, emphatically, the temple of God was the church of Christ. This is the temple in which his prophetic eye saw the man of sin seated. It is no person in a temple of stone, but a power in the Christian church. Now, if these people were so convinced, then what changed? His seat. Observe the position of the man of, seat, of sin. Notice, he sits in the temple. He sitteth. Now, this is used in the Bible with reference to the Pharisees, which sit in Moses' seat. And the Greek word there is the word katizo, from which we get the word cathedral. So he says this man sits in the cathedral position and he takes the prerogative as the representative of Christ. So he sits in the bishop's seat. And you also get the expression ex cathedra. When the Pope speaks infallibly, then he speaks ex cathedra, out of his cathedral position. Now here's another point, just by the way, which is not in their reformed position, which I'll add. A cathedral is a temple. It's not a church. It's a temple. Why? Because it has an altar. And on the altar, there's an offering. And the offering is the Mass. And according to their theology, the offering of the Mass is identical to the offering of the cross. But the Bible says Jesus was sacrificed once for all. So here you have a continuous sacrifice which is contrary to the Bible. Okay? And so he says, he sits here, as the pretended vicar, but the real antagonist of Christ, undermining his authority, abolishing his laws, and oppressing his people. So he says, let's compare Daniel and Paul, both are Roman. They both have the same chronological point of origin. They arise on the fall of the old undivided empire of Rome. Paul has a marvelous description where he says, when he be taken out of the way, then he, Antichrist, will arise. And if you read all the early church fathers as to what Paul meant, then they all say, when the Roman Empire falls, Antichrist will rise. So they have the same chronological point of origin. Both exalt themselves against God. Both begin small but become influential. 
Both claimed to be teachers of men. He was a bishop or an overseer. He was to have a mouth, that was, he was to be a teacher. And he was an overseer, that's why he had eyes. Both are persecutors. Daniel describes him as wearing out the saints. And Paul describes him as opposing so to sum up, they have the same place, Rome, the same period, the 6th century to the second coming of Jesus, the same character, the same lawlessness, the same defiance of God. And then he ends up by saying, these resemblances are so important, so numerous, so comprehensive and exact as to prove beyond all question that the self-exalting, persecuting power predicted by Daniel and, and this man of sin foretold by Paul are one and the same power even Romanists admit it to be the case and call the power thus doubly predicted the Antichrist. Reformed position. Now you might say, that's one writer of the Church of England. So just to make sure, let's go to the other reformers and make sure that this was their theology. Let's start with Nicholas von Amstorff, just for his credentials. Luther said of him, my spirit finds rest in my dear Amstorff. They were personal friends. And this is what Amstorff wrote. And he said, The Antichrist will be revealed and come to naught before the last days, so that every man shall comprehend and recognize that the Pope is the real true Antichrist and not the Vicar of Christ. Therefore, those who consider the Pope and his bishops as Christian shepherds and bishops are deeply in error. And then he says something fascinating. But even more are those who believe that the Turk is the Antichrist. Now you know what? Solomon already said there's nothing new under the sun. How many people today believe that Islam is the real danger on the planet? Well, CNN certainly wants you to believe it, don't they? How many of you have ever been to the Middle East? You've been to the Middle East? Good. And uh, how do the people travel around there? Who's ever been to Syria, for example? I've been from, through Syria from the north to the south, from the east to the west, and I've never, ever seen a poorer country in all my life. Little Bedouins on donkeys with sticks. You would think all those donkeys were nuclear bombs if you listen to CNN. It's amazing what's going on in the world. So he says, even more in error are those who think the Turk, you can put Islam in that place, is the Antichrist. Because the Turk rules outside of the church, does not sit in the holy place, nor does he seek to bear the name of Christ, but is an open antagonist of Christ in his church. Which is, because Islam says, Jesus is not the Son of God. Islam says, Jesus never died for you. The Islam teaches there's no atonement. There was no shedding of blood. It was an illusion. It was made to appear like that. This does not need to be revealed, but it's clear and evident because he persecutes Christians openly and not as the Pope does, secretly under the form of godliness. And here's another theologian, Flacius, 1570. He's also one of the prophecy people of the Lutheran Church. The sixth and last reason for our separation from the Pope is the following. By many writings of the Church, the divinely inspired word, prophecies concerning the future, and the characteristics of the papacy, it has been profusely and thoroughly proved that the Pope, with his prelates and clergy, is the real true Antichrist, that his kingdom is the real Babylon, never-ceasing fountain and mother of all abominable idolatry. They had strong words, the Reformers. They didn't mince words. I think he could be in trouble for hate speech today. George Nigrinus, another one, is an evangelical theologian and satirist from Hesse, Germany, and he's talking about the Jesuits. Let me just backtrack a little bit there. The Jesuits were specifically formed to destroy the Reformation. That's why they were called into existence. Their founder, Ignatius Loyola, and his friends, which was Peter Faber and Francis Xavier, all of them saints today, those three were called to destroy the Reformation. And today we have a Jesuit 
sitting on the throne in Rome. Pope Francis is a Jesuit. The Jesuits claim to be sorely offended and have taken my declaration as an insult and a blasphemy in branding the papacy as Antichrist. And he says, but Daniel, Paul, Peter, John, and even Christ prophesied this. Christ said in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, as prophesied by the prophet Daniel. What fascinates me that the new translation put that in brackets as though Christ never said it. He did. But this is as true as it is that Jesus is the Messiah and I'm prepared to show it even from their own definition. And then he says, this Jesuit further contends that the papacy cannot be antichrist because the papacy has lasted for centuries. But that the antichrist is supposed to reign only three and a half years. Isn't that what the world believes today? The entire evangelical world believes that. They all teach it. They've all just been to go and visit in Rome and they preach a literal three and a half years. But that's not what the reformers believe. He says he's supposed to reign only three and a half years. But no one doubts today that Daniel spoke of your days, not literal days. The prophetic time periods of 42 months, 1,260 days, one, two and a half times are prophetic and according to Daniel 4, day must be taken for the year. Now, the Jesuits claim the Antiochus theory and the Futurist theory. But it doesn't fit into the profile of Daniel chapter 7. Here's another one. David Christus, he's the father of the, one of the fathers of the Lutheran church. And he said he revealed, the Lord revealed to Daniel how long the kingdoms would last. And Paul describes in 2 Thessalonians this anti-Christian power. And he says basically exactly the same thing. This is what they all believe. Calvin believed it. He said, some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself. And then he quotes Paul's words. So this is what Calvinism used to believe. John Knox, well, he was a Presbyterian, a Calvinist. He talks, talked about the tyranny of the papacy. And as with Luther, he concluded the very Antichrist and the son of perdition of whom Paul spoke, papacy. Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer was the Catholic Archbishop of England who became a Protestant. And then they took his two best friends, the two bishops, one of London and the other one of Worcester, and they burnt them in front of his eyes. And he affrighted for a while, recanted for a while, and then found his resolve and died at the stake himself, whereof it followeth Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be the very Antichrist himself. He is a Catholic archbishop who became the first Protestant archbishop in England. And he says, I can prove it from the scripture. Roger Williams, he was the first Baptist pastor in America. He said exactly the same thing. He says, this is what we believe. The Pope, the pretended vicar who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself. And here's the Baptist confession. That the Pope of Rome is the man of sin, the son of perdition, that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now here's a problem. Some Baptist representatives have just been to the papacy asking for unification with that church. So what's happened? This was their public profession of faith regarding this issue. And today they've buried it. They don't believe it anymore. This is the Westminster Confession. This is the rest of Protestantism. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof. But is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God? If these reformers were right, if they were right, then the entire modern theology regarding the Antichrist is wrong. 
They can't both be right. They're mutually exclusive. Would you agree? John Wesley called the papacy emphatic sen in an emphatic sense the man of sin, the son of perdition. They didn't make any bones about it. Spurgeon, he went even further. He said, it is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. He is the greatest preacher that Protestantism has, has produced. If it be not the popery in the Church of Rome, there's nothing in the world that can be called by that name. It's either that or nothing. If there were to be issued a hue and cry for Antichrist, we would certainly take up this church on suspicion and it would certainly not be let loose again for it so exactly answers the description. Then why have they let it loose? Popery is contrary to Christ's gospel. It is Antichrist and we ought to pray against it. It should be the daily prayer of every believer that Antichrist might be hurled like a millstone into the flood and fall Christ because it wounds Christ. It robs Christ of his glory. It puts a sacramental efficacy in the place of his atonement, lifts a piece of bread in the place of the Savior, a few drops of water in the place of the Holy Ghost, puts a mere fallible man like ourselves up as the vicar of Christ on earth. But then he softens it and says, if we pray against it because it is against him, we shall love the persons, though we hate their errors. We shall love their souls, though we loathe and detest their dogmas. And so the breath of our prayers will be sweetened because we turn our faces towards Christ when we pray. And that's what I said in the beginning. It's not against individuals. It's not about Catholics. Catholics are sincere people, believe me. They want to do what is good. And they do great works. And they want to help people. And they have many Christian charitable efforts. And they are to be commended for it. But you cannot be saved by your works. Salvation is through Christ. And the gospel is salvation in Christ. And any other gospel, according to the Bible, is an accursed gospel. Isn't that so? Let any man preach any gospel but what we have preached, let him be. The Bible says it, not me. This is the Wartburg, where Martin Luther translated the New Testament. Today it's a UNESCO heritage site. It's beautifully restored. And uh, we went there, and these are the halls, of course it was, Catholic at that time. So you'll find St. Franciscus there, and St. Elizabeth, who was the first German saint. She lived in about 800 AD. And you'll find all these pictures of all these venerated saints. And uh, when I was there, they had a concert for St. Elizabeth. And they were all very excited about St. Elizabeth. Inside you will find the typical style, beautiful mosaics and gold and silver. But I found it fascinating. In the entrance hall where you paid to go through the Wartburg, there were these pictures. And the contrast just blew me away. Elisabeth von Thüringen. There's St. Elizabeth, someone kneeling down to her receiving grace from her. By the way, doesn't the Bible say you're not supposed to kneel down to anyone? And by contrast, Martin Luther, with his arrogant little face and a beer in his hand. And then they have this picture of Luther saying, here spreie ich und kann ich anders. Here I'm spraying and I can do no other. Mocking his famous words where he said, here I stand. I can do no other. Where he took his stand upon the word of God. So, what is this? This is a UNESCO heritage site. It is the Protestant bastion. And Elizabeth's ring, ooh, if you touch the ring, you will be holy. Now, this place over here is the building in which Martin Luther actually did the translation. Now, what I found interesting, as we were going through this tour, there were a whole lot of people, and there was one man who was dressed in leather from top to bottom. He was a biker, and he had a crash helmet in his hand. And the more we went on this tour, and in every room, the guide would tell us, oh, in this room, St. Elizabeth did this, that, that, and the other. 
And we went to the next room and the guide would say, oh, in this room, St. Elizabeth did this, that, that, and the other. And this person was becoming more and more agitated and eventually he blew a gasket. He exploded. And he said, I am a Lutheran minister. Which took me aback because I had judged him quite differently by his attire. I am a Lutheran minister and I'm sick and tired of hearing about St. Elizabeth. I came here to see where Martin Luther translated the Bible. And when are you coming to that, sir? And the guide, not taken aback at all, said, it's not part of the tour. <laughs> at which the whole group became Protestant. <laughs> and I aligned myself with the man in leather, and I said, I'm with you in this. We shall protest and insist that we paid good money to come and see what we should see. And they refused. So as good Protestants, we went to the head office and protested. And eventually, we actually just walked in there and they ran after us. And the door was closed. This is the lady in charge. And she then opened the door for us. It was, we were pretty insistent in as nice a way as we could be. And that's what it looked like. There was the old desk. And there's a picture. Let's take a step back. That's what it looks like. And what struck me immediately is the contrast. The glitz and the glitter and you know, the gold and the, the mosaics and the miracles and the this and the that. And here, this absolute simplicity. And there's a picture of his friend Melancton and a simple little desk. And these are replicas of what they were like, exactly like. But this is original. This is uh, one of the vertebrae of a whale. And Martin Luther used that as his footstool. So you can see even still the wearing out of the impression of his feet as he stood there and contemplated. And in this simple surrounding, with no glitz, no glamour, no nothing, the world received the greatest gift that has ever been given to the world. The word of God in a tongue that everyone can understand. There's another one of Luther's houses at Eisenach, another little museum. It says very little today. It's as if the Reformation has been wiped out. People don't know what the Reformers believe. They have no idea what those images are. None of their theology is still in the minds of men. The counter-theology has totally obliterated Protestantism. You know, when Protestantism was called, it wasn't just called theologically. It was a whole system. All the great composers like Handel and Haydn and Bach and Beethoven and all of these people, they were inspired by religion and the great hymns and the things that we sing today brought glory to God and God was put back into the center rather than the system. And this was, this was an amazing awakening. This is the actual church where Martin Luther preached, and it says there, Eine feste Burg ist unser Gott. A mighty fortress is our God. And today, the entire church outside is full of graffiti. And I'm sure it wasn't Martin Luther who said, hier spreche ich und kann ich anders. So what is, what is the secular view of religion? God has been sidelined. The Reformation has been sidelined. The view of the Antichrist has been sidelined. Matthew 24, 3 and 4. Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples come to him privately and say, Tell us, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And the very first sign that Jesus mentions is, Take heed that no man deceive you. 
Now, we started off with an evolution lecture. How adamant is the world to make creation of non-effect? Pretty adamant, aren't they? They even write it into the legislation. You shall not believe the scriptures. You shall believe the interpretation of science. Now, if the world is so adamant to obliterate the beginning of the word, don't you think they'll be even more adamant to obliterate the end? Do you think it's possible that a great deception is being preached in the world and the sands of time have covered up what the reformers had opened up and made visible and given to the world? We have a decision to make. Now in the lectures that come, we are going to unpack this. And if this is true, that this power is really the power that controls the world, then it can't just be hearsay, there must be proof. And we will unpack it in the next lectures, prophetically, and in real time, in terms of what's happening today, and you will be shocked to see that the reformers were absolutely right. May God bless you as you contemplate this. Don't see it as an attack. See it as a prophetic revelation. Remember, every single reformer was a Roman Catholic before he became a reformer. Amen. Thank you.